So good morning, everyone. Really thrilled um, to welcome so many old and new friends. Um, my name is Susan Jennings. I'm executive director of the Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions. And I'm really, really thrilled to welcome you to our annual conference, Pathways to Regeneration, Restoration, Resiliency, and Reciprocity. The Arthur Morgan Institute turns 80 this November, this year. Um, it was founded in 1940 by Arthur Morgan. And over the past 80 years, we've hosted over 100 conferences and workshops. This is the first annual conference that we've hosted online, and we're both saddened and excited to be speaking with you virtually. We've really loved the intimacy of gathering with you in Yellow Springs, but we know from the conference registrations and from seeing folks this morning um, that we are welcoming new friends and old from across the country. So we're really, really grateful to have you here. And of course, um, the times, as our conference language suggests, sharpens our, sharpen our awareness and create urgency. There's no time that we're more in need of practical solutions for our converging crises. And we are glad to be in conversation with you about the kind of hope that comes from working together toward a healthy future. Over the next few days, you'll hear from pioneering thinkers and doers sharing both practical and philosophical tools for transition. Your voice is an important part of the conversation and you can join us, uh, you can join your voice through the chat button or the Q&A, which are in the bottom of your Zoom screen um, during the times after the presentations. We're also running a water cooler, which is a separate Zoom link from nine to 6 p.m. today and then again tomorrow. And that's a time for you to meet speakers um, and fellow attendees to have deeper conversations. A note that the Zoom links for tomorrow are going to be different than the ones for today. So keep a lookout um, for an email tomorrow morning with information about how to log in then. Um, we have, uh, we planned this conference. We actually started planning it a week after last year's conference. So for about six months uh, during our planning, we assumed that we are going to be hosting this in person. So we actually have a pretty packed schedule because we essentially took what was going to be a face-to-face -face conference and moved it all online. So there's, there's a lot um, there's a lot of sitting. We have added a bunch of breaks for folks to be able to stand up and stretch and get something to eat. Um, and Rachel Isaacson, our amazing Zoom host and uh, just techno whiz and uh, conference czar has um, really put in some amazing break uh, videos. So if you decide to stick around between the, um, the speakers, you'll also get a, get a real treat. I also want to acknowledge our other conference planners who are Beth Bridgman, Denny Eagleson, Don Knickerbocker, and Peggy Nestor. You'll meet them over the course of the weekend, but they are really the women who have made this conference such an amazing um, lineup of speakers. We also wanted to thank our conference sponsors and we'll do that more thoroughly a little later. So now I want to introduce our first speaker, um, who is Don Knickerbocker, who's going to be speaking about reciprocity in Native American traditions. Don Knickerbocker belongs to the Anish Anishinaabe people. She's a citizen of the White Earth Nation and is an enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe from the Otter Tail Pillager Band of Indians. She is an environmentalist and activist working on culturally based sustainable development issues and decolonization in her community and on her reservation. She's also, I'm happy to say, the newest member of the Community Solutions staff. Today, Dawn will be presenting on Native American indigenous model of economic and social exchanges, as well as relationships with the natural world on the reciprocity in all natural systems. There will be a Q&A at the end of her presentation, so please post your questions in the chat and we will get to them um, during the Q&A. Uh, Dawn is also going to start us off with a land acknowledgement. So Dawn. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I'm Don Knickerbocker. I'll start you off with a land acknowledgement. This morning, I heard from Chief Ben Barnes. He's the chief of the Shawnee Nation of the Eastern Shawnee and the Absentee Shawnee Nation. And we went over how he wanted to be acknowledged 
um, on the land and he was very generous and uh, gave his approval. So the land that surrounds us is part of who we are. It reflects our histories. The Arthur Morgan Institute for Community Solutions and Agraria is an organization led by and for people and the land. We are based in Yellow Springs, Ohio, not far from the place where the streams meet that feed into the beautiful rivers. Ohio means beautiful river. These waterways are central to the indigenous creation stories of this land. There are many other sacred stories and sites near us, including mounds that are waiting for us to hear. We need to protect and honor these histories and people and these places. And yet, indigenous people are not relics of the past. We are still here. Today, I invite you from wherever you are to plant your feet on the ground and take a moment to reflect. <clears throat> Please join us as we recognize and acknowledge that Ohio and the Midwest are built on the indigenous homelands of the good and many people of the Osage, Miami, the Shawnee Nations, and the Adena Hopewell peoples and other Algonquin speaking bands. Today, we are gathered on the unceded land of these people. And I ask you to acknowledge these communities, their elders, past, present, and future generations. We acknowledge that this place was founded on the exclusion and erasure of indigenous knowledge about how to care for these lands. We are obligated to support and educate each other with accurate information about the true history of this land and decolonize, which means that we strive to be in service of the water and the rivers and the animals in relational solidarity with them and as people now on this land, we must do what we can to provide nature and wildness with protection and defense. So that's it. That uh, land acknowledgement was authored by me and with the approval of Chief Ben Barnes of the Shawnee Nations, also Shane Creeping Bear and Jerry Neri. So I think now I will start the presentation um, for today. It is called Reciprocity in Native American Traditions. And I'm just going to share my screen. So I'm, I'm going to start out with um, a traditional Anishinaabe greeting, Buzu Ani Don Indichnakats Anishinaabe Kwi Makwa Dodem Indo Jaba Gawaba Agagakan. Greetings to you um, in, on this Oma Aking. Aking is the mother and the grandmother and the giver of life of earth. And I'm what I refer to as. Um, an urban Indian. I did not grow up on my reservation, White Earth Nation, um, but my relatives did. My uh, father, my grandparents, and everyone before them, Mioge Shikukwe, Duish, and Tijan. That's who I am, and that's my family. I belong to the Anishinaabe people. I'm a citizen of White Earth Nation. And I'm an enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe from the Otter Tail Pillager Band of Indians. So now we start. So reciprocity. This isn't a really important subject to me. Uh, I grew up on a dairy goat farm, always having my hands in the dirt. I rode my horses bareback on the land and we grew and we ground our own grains. And I knew what the earth was capable of, even from a small person, all the way until now to today. So I'm going to speak about the land um, and about um, our relationship with it, the economic, social, um, and in reciprocity. My teachers are Anishinaabe, um, Ignita 
who is um, just move something really quick on my screen. Um, an Ojibwe elder um, who from Pine Point on uh, White Earth Nation. She gave me the foundation of what I know and what I will share. And there's been many other elders throughout my lifetime. Uh, the result um, is what is traditional in Ojibwe ceremonies and Anishinaabe ceremonies. And it comes through sometimes as stories, as personal histories, uh, even as the originator of life itself. Anishinaabe culture goes a long way and it's based on the land. For instance, the languages that we know of hold many answers as we are caretakers. So I also want to start out with talking about some points of basic modern neuroscience that says that the brain has re evolved over time to reward cooperation, service, what is referred to as reciprocal altruism. And we see this working in all living beings. And when it's working well, when nutrition isn't suffering or acute, but even when there is um, damaged brain material, human beings remain in service and connection. Uh, in evolutionary biology, reciprocal altruism is where an organism acts in a manner that reduces its own fitness while increasing the fitness of others. In other words, human beings harness original instructions in our brain. Extreme individualism, greed, and violence are pathological and signs of physical, developmental, cultural, spiritual, and institutional system failures. Caring relationships are the foundation of healthy families, communities, and life itself. So reciprocity is how we behave in the wild. It is who we are. So here, the indigenous people call North America Turtle Island. It, it is shaped like a turtle. There are many origin stories that tell us how to be in cooperation with the standard good life is what many indigenous people call it here on Turtle Island. And I'll tell you a little story. When settlers came, they asked the indigenous people for the names of the big places here, where we now know we have Canada and the United States of America and Mexico. And because these boundaries were pretty arbitrary to the indigenous people, it was less important to them to name those. So settlers came and said, hey, what is this land called? And the indigenous people said, I don't know, but this is my Kanita, then my village. And the settlers would say, okay, this is the land of Canada. And that's really how we got the names of the large places here were often taken from indigenous names, but not because we were naming them ourselves. So you'll hear, still hear people say, what is the Indian word for Australia or Florida or the Philippines or British Columbia? And the question really is, what do settlers call the places where the river current begins to quicken? or where the migratory birds land in the spring, or where that rock is that is shaped like an ancestor? The answer is nothing, because they don't have a name, they have a relationship with the land. And the names that appear on maps represent the big places, not the small ones. The big places are defined and thus named by colonizers and settlers, but they are no less indigenous land. And the settlers and colonizers, they asked the people, what are your names? And in our Algonquin Anishinaabe language, Anishinaabe 
literally means the people. In Lakota, the word Lakota means the people. The Miami tribe, Miami is, means the people. The Seminole, they call themselves the people, the unconquered people. <laughs> the Diné, that means the people. And the Europeans and different settlers gave us different names. They came to my people, the Anishinaabe, and they looked at our shoes and their the pucker-toed shoes called the Chippewa and they named us the Chippewa. And they went to the Lakota and they said that they were like little snakes. And so they called them the Sioux. And they went to the Diné and they said they were like knives and they named them the Navajo. But to us, we are still the people of the land. And our origin stories tell us if you understand the people, we are the Anishinaabe. We used to be the people of the deep blue waters until we became the people of the woodlands. And if we're defining ourselves as the people, we are the people of the land. And I spent some time out west and I was visiting the Salishan people who are the people of the blue green water and the people of the clear salt water. And I spent time near Standing Rock and the people of the starry sky or the people of the tall pine trees. And I visited with the University of Arizona and the people of the four sacred mountains. And the thing is that relationship to the land is a primary way of identifying ourselves. What I want to tell you next does not come from me, but from my teachings. It is that we are the earth. And I don't exactly know who told me that. My dad used to tell me that everything has a spirit. The trees have a spirit. The land has a spirit. The rocks have a spirit. And they are no different than who we are. And when you're given a seed to plant, you are given a relative. And when you harvest medicines, you do it in a good way. And if necessary, you do not take the roots. And you recognize that the earth needs you just as much as you need the earth. And this is important to remember, as Joy Harjo said, who's the poet laureate, my generation is now the doorway to a memory. That is why I am remembering. She goes on to say that she sends her greetings to all her relations who make life rich, who remind her daily of the responsibilities to honor their gifts while we are here on this earth with like time is a thread through her hands in the joy, in the grief, in the tears, thankful for the continued sunrises and sunsets. Especially now during this time of COVID it is important to remember we have all of this. If you've read Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge, Teachings, and Plants, action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between self and the world is reciprocal. It is not a question of first getting enlightened or sage and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. Frankly, we are all so busy with life. We're habitually human focused, conscious of ourselves only, and too commonly unaware of our profound impact on nature itself. And we end up forgetting the other half of the back and forth required for all life. And so there's some bad news. There's some consequences. Humans have failed the earth. Let's start with the dirt. The ecosystem degradation is in a global uh, issue right now expected that by 20, 20, 2050, 95% of the earth's soil will be degraded. 
that's 24 billion tons that is eroded annually by unsustainable agriculture and land degradation. And it's the leading cause of ecosystem failures. Uh, our forests. New research is constantly demonstrating the situation. One study recently focused on the consequence of indiscriminate, indiscriminate deforestation. Um, and it suggests that we have a small probability of surviving the next 20 to 40 years without a catastrophic collapse of what, um, what we know now. And I have links to all of these statistics for you to look at. Some of this data just came out. And the ownership of seeds is a, a modern catastrophe. And it's getting worse all the time. In 2008, six corporations own the majority of seeds. And today, it's just four. It's a seed monopoly. And when you think of the seeds as your relatives, how can you own them? It makes no sense to me. According to the United Nations environmental um, chief, COVID-19 pandemic is not a silver lining for the environment, as people have been saying recently. It's not enough to stop driving for six months to a year or manufacturing for six months to a year to stop the uh, alter of the planet's surface. It's, it isn't a bad thing for human activity to be on the earth and living in relationship but and, and alter the earth as indigenous people have been doing so um, in, since time immemorial. But it's the humanity's expansion of industrial activity that has treated the earth as though it's simply a resource. It's put forests, fresh waters at risk on every corner of the planet, replacing it with industrial um, sharp corners and flat surfaces. Our relationship with Aki, the giver of life, is critical to our own survival. She provides us with oxygen, regula regulates our weather, our, our pollinators, our crops, our food. But I am speaking to the audience that knows this already. So there's a myth that persists that indigenous people were just leaving the land the way that it was, that it was a wildness here. But in fact, there, it, there wasn't, it wasn't sparsely populated. There were people here. There's pre-settlers. There were populations that had modified the earth. With, they, they worked in conjunction with wildlife. There were great earthworks, roads, fields. There were um, fields of foods, all kinds of foods, corn, bean, squash here in the Ohio's. There were trading routes all throughout the United States of what we know now as the United States and all of Turtle Island that connected places where people would trade things. Even the providence of the mounds in Ohio are filled with items like bear's claws, salmon bones, copper, things that have been traded all over Turtle Island. This here is Chief Oshkosh. He was the chief of the Menominee Indians. He gave instructions to his people in the mid 1800s up until his death. He talked about how we create a circle if we take care of her, Mother Earth, that she will always be there to take care of you. And in the tradition of planting, 
in the way that he instructed his people, they were able to keep their land and feed their people and are still thriving to this day because they still have those instructions. And speaking of the circle, my people, the Anishinaabe Ojibwe people, our language is based on the importance of memory, of listening. My grandfather used to say, if you listen, you hear the patterns of life. Children are taught the importance of listening, especially to old people. It's been our custom to tell stories. And many of our stories are told verbatim to this day since time immemorial. And that's true. The story of the circle that I was told by my relative before she died, Anita, she experienced both on the reservation and in life. And she was familiar with the old ways and she also lived off the reservation for a while with me. And she told me a story of a time when the people would make a circle. We would start the circle knowing our Ojibwe ways and the people would move further and further away from the generations, from the knowledge, from the land. And soon, they would be starting to close the circle. They would come back and they would start to listen. There would be those who would ask questions and those who will remember. And before the circle closed, the people would return, but this time they would not be alone. They would come with new people. And that is all of you. So what is missing now and what else is being threatened is indigenous culture. It's ultimately the connection that we need to this land. It is the erosion of the ecosystem that can be saved. The knowledge is often hyper-localized in indigenous knowledge and in indigenous ways. And over many, many thousands of years, people have held this knowledge and if they don't have access to it now in their current state of being in colonization, they have access to it because it lives in their bones through their seven generations. And what we know now about the word sustainability, it's a common environmental story. I want to share with you a story from Carol Crow, an Algonquin ecologist, how she explained that when she was first going out to conferences, traveling um, to conferences about sustainable development early in her career, she explained to her father what she was doing and he paused and he said, tell them that among our people, our concern is not what we can take from the land, but what we can give. And that's the different kind of way that we need to think about sustainability. How can we sustain giving? And what about the awareness of the problematic roots of the environmental movement, which began in the 1800s with a group of men who believed in eugenics and the erasure of native people their movement dovetailed into brutal genocide of natives. And at the time, some environmental scientists were allied and sometimes one and the same with prospectors. Regenerative agriculture, of course, has grown quite dramatically, and especially since 2014 or 15. And at the same time, this movement's origins of agriculture in the United States has stopped using the advice of native people, the actual stewards of this land. There's an article from a friend of mine in Nonprofit Quarterly. He's the, one of the executive producers of the film Gather, if you've seen that film. It's Ajay said, 
If there is a lesson to be learned from distant timelines of the environmental conservation movement and the study of agriculture, it is that the stories are largely controlled by the founders who chose to mythologize or even omit altogether indigenous people. Regenerative agriculture is at its very early stages and could incorporate indigenous founders, practitioners, and communities into its understanding, ethos, and practices in its attempt to regenerate diminished, exhausted, and exploited lands as a result of anthropomorphic agricultural systems. Regenerative agriculture shouldn't focus on the soil itself. The story of our soils, our lands, and the indigenous people who carry these stories, those harms and those histories have always been the beginning of our story. Whether told or not, these are the stories, not just the tale of the food production and the resource management, but the tale of exploitive institution that damaged our entire society. And this story continues but now it continues with narratives of strength and love and painstaking survival, fortitude, endurance, and adaptability that even the most powerful of institutions could not erase despite attempts. After all, when it comes to the revitalization of a damaged system, indigenous people have quite literally lived and continue to live through all phases from creation to destruction to regeneration. And so in my understanding of reciprocity and what has been granted, what is most personal is also most universal. And we all have those lessons of reciprocity from our own lives. So there are some solutions that the indigenous environmental movement and network have put together different plans of action for regeneration, which includes direct action in four different areas. The seeds, the water, the plants, and the fruits of our labor, the flora. The seeds are our, represent uh, the narrative our story. And if we understand that, we always have to begin with our stories and what we've been told and what we listen to. The water, of course, is wisdom. Water is life. You've heard us say this before. Our narratives are nourished and made strengthened through organizing and connecting in my indigenous culture, it's the women who are the keepers of the water. And it is the root role of women in organizing. And I don't mean that quite literally with a literal woman, but I mean the feminine energy, which we all have access to, whether you are born male or female or other. And the next is the plants, represents policy development and building. With our seeds nourished by organizing, we're better positioned to design and develop informed by our principles. And finally, flora is democracy. It is the food that is shared with all the people. It becomes seeds again for new groundings. It is what intersects. It is our life and our power. It is, it enlivens our collectives and us as individuals both. So a reciprocal relationship with nature in all aspects of life, from spirituality to making a difference in the earth, um, to me, it means to indigenize. It's transformational. It is from local culture, especially the use of more um, indigenous knowledge in administration, 
in employment, in recognizing in all of our systems from health to medicines to our farming practices. Miigwech, that means thank you in Ojibwe and Anishinaabe. So I will stop sharing. And that puts me right about 940. And I would love to be able to um, open it up for questions. If anybody has questions they would like to put yes, in the chat yeah. or unmute. Yes. Thank you. That was really beautiful. So folks, you can find the chat button right at the bottom of your screen if you have questions for Dawn. Dawn, I know one of the things that you said often um, here at Agraria is that there's a concern that folks think about Indigenous people as being sort of the history and the past, whereas we have, there are there's a lot going on um, just in terms of living, but then also in terms of environmental activism. In fact, Indigenous people across the planet really are on the front lines of many of the um, earth protection and water protection circles. Would you like to talk a little bit about that and how we as non-Indigenous or non-Indigenous, maybe to Turtle Island um, can be more mindful of um, how we speak of Indigenous people? Yes, I really appreciate that question. I think many people heard about the solidarity among the many different tribal nations here, um, starting with Standing Rock, where indigenous people from many, many tribes and nations from all over Turtle Island convened together to fight a pipeline that was planning to go through unceded territorial lands of the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota people on the Sioux Reservation. And it's interesting that to note that everybody is willing to show up for Mother Earth because it is embedded in all of the different traditions. It's important to recognize that there are many, many cultures here. There are 572 federally recognized tribes in the United States. There are about 250 or so more who are in different states of recognition or trying to seek recognition. Each one of those has their own language, their own culture, their own relationship with the federal government. Uh, there are another 600 or so tribes up in Canada and many others in Mexico. And at the time of tribes we didn't even really call ourselves tribes. We were different nations that interacted with one another. And so it, it is very respectful to understand the names of the people on the land where you reside, uh, to understand the issues that they are dealing with. And of course, all of this takes time and relationship. These are things that Indigenous people have been advocating for to happen in school systems. Uh, Washington State just last year was the first out of all of the 50 states to require that Indigenous elders contribute to Native American curriculum in schools. Uh, the knowledge should also be delivered uh, wherever you're, wherever you reside from indigenous people from that land. I, as I've said, I am Anishinaabe, but I am a visitor here in Ohio, just like everybody else. So I do share a common thread with the people of Ohio in understanding that the land is Mother Earth, that we have a responsibility, and this is the standard among indigenous people but I do not assume to know anybody's origin stories. I do not assume to know how to care for this land. And it's my obligation as a visitor to understand that. That was the first thing I did when I moved to Ohio three years ago was to find out who the indigenous people were 
and are, and then build that relationship. And that is how we build trust. Thank you. So thank you so much, Don. And there's a lot of appreciation showing up for you in the chat. And I should say that Don is the artist who actually painted the slide. So a multi-talented woman. Um, Don, uh, Rachel asked a really good question of what does it mean to indigenize or re-indigenize a landscape or an organization? Yeah, uh, that is the very best question. <laughs> so re-indigenize is kind of the counter to um, some, of, some of the talk about colonization and decolonizing. The, the colonized mind is what a lot of indigenous people have referred to because there are many institutions and scholars who have discovered. They've discovered people, they've discovered ways, they've discovered medicines, but these actually belong to the indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge in general has been thought of as mystical, magical, superstitious. Uh, for instance, when I was in the Salishan territory and we were in ceremony, uh, one of the practices was when there was a thunder and lightning storm was to take some white cedar and tie it to the top of the teepee poles and to also burn some into the fire and let the, the crackly sparks light up so that you would be protected um, by creator from being struck by lightning. Well, a year and a half ago, some uh, white scientists from an agricultural uh, um, federally government, federal government uh, organization did some studies on the white cedar and found that it's the only negatively charged uh, tree in the forest. So to dismiss the indigenous knowledge as mythical, as non-scientific, as not being 10,000 year old understanding of the land that we're on, especially by people who value the land more than anything else, as much as they value their own children and their own relatives, is very dismissive. And so part of decolonizing is kind of throwing off the idea that all knowledge comes from uh, the colonial institutions that are now here. And re-indigenizing is accepting leaders from indigenous places, indigenous stories, wisdom, all the things that I talked about in the presentation. So many of these stories and traditions and ceremonies have been uh, kept pristine since time immemorial. Reindigenizing is not only recognizing that, but building relationships with that through the organization. Uh, an incredible model is what we are doing at Community Solutions. And I mean, I'm not bragging, but uh, I was brought in over a year ago to be on a committee. And I sat in a room with these incredible women who'd been spending their entire lives working on these issues. And they were the most open people I've ever met in the middle of Ohio. They were asking questions. They were respectful, resourceful. They were, as my grandfather used to say, two ears, one mouth. We listen twice as much as we speak. And every opportunity they had to find out more, they did. And which is why we're here today. So that's how organizations can take part in re-indigenizing, is to actually listen to the people. Thank, thank you so much, Don. Um, there's actually a number of questions about how mm -hmm. folks connect with the indigenous people of their area. 
um, which we could talk about, but I'm also interested in this question from Eunice Brevik about um, how reciprocity relates to historical injustices and i.e. what might justice look like as it relates to broken treaties and misplaced peoples. And I did want to also mention that tomorrow, Greg Watson from the Schumacher Center is going to be talking a little bit about land um, as a reparation tool for African-American injustices or injustices to African-Americans. So Don, is, what is the conversation around reparations or reciprocity? Obviously, Indigenous people have had the majority of their land taken from them. What what does reciprocity look like in that regard or reparations? Yeah, I love that question. Thank you so much, Eunice. So the, the broken treaties are definitely an issue. There are many different movements across Turtle Island um, called land back. There's like hashtags that you can look up on social media about land back. And those are really geared towards specific places like Bears Ears, Mount Rushmore, uh, many of the national parks and forests that are devoid of the indigenous people who have been taking care of and, and uh, manicuring those spaces um, since time immemorial. The idea that the people, that the land must be devoid of people is false is a narrative that um, needs to shift. Uh, it just needs to be the people who have an understanding of what they're dealing with that needs to happen. In terms of writing historical wrongs and historical injustices. So I've, I worked in the state of Washington. I was, um, elected as the chair of the advisory commission on diversity for the most diverse city in the state of Washington. And in that role and at that time, we worked on diversity. We worked on um, civil rights and as a baseline of making sure that everybody had rights, everybody had um, basic civil rights, not even basic human rights, but just civil. And then we were being progressive and we moved toward a model of diversity and inclusion. So the next step after basic civil rights was we are inviting people to the table. We needed more representation on boards, in boardrooms, in leadership positions, and we wanted to hear voices. Well, that is not where we're at today. That is actually not enough. Where we need to move today, it is justice. And justice, if you are familiar with the legal system here and the Iroquois legal system, you know that justice restores. Justice makes people whole again. And so what that means now as we move past basic civil rights through diversity and inclusion, and now today into an ethos of justice, we are making whole again, which means different things to different people. We're not through that messy conversation yet. Clearly, we have people in the streets shouting at the tops of their lungs, putting everything at risk in order to be heard. So one of the things that indigenous people are looking for solidarity around are issues of corporations having the priority over the lives of people. What's happening right now, as a matter of fact, on my own reservation at White Earth Nation is line three of the Enbridge pipeline is planning to come through our Newman fields. And I was just texting last night with Winona LaDuc about the new action that's happening right after uh, Thanksgiving. Um, she's inviting people to come up and stand in solidarity against the pipelines that would threaten three reservations up in White Earth, including my own. It is the practice of putting the extractive industries 
in front of the lives of people and the life of the earth that should restore. I guess that's a long story. <laughs> well, that's I hope that answers it. I'm hearing that that's a practical way that people can can support well, and it's not obviously just supporting indigenous people, it's really preserving the planet by supporting them in actions. Right? There's a number of questions about how people, including folks in Yellow Springs and someone here from New Mexico, about how to get in contact and uh, learn from local indigenous uh, people. And then also a question about the Planet Drum Foundation in uh, the Bay Area in San Francisco. Questions about how people, if they, if they wanna know more um, either generally or specifically to their area, what, what are some resources you might suggest they, they access? Yeah, so in, in terms of Native American um, solidarity, Standing Rock only happened four years ago. And we know colonization really, really works when you divide and conquer people and you put them into war camps. And so a lot of indigenous people really before Standing Rock had not really talked to each other a whole lot since colonization. We had different institutes like the um, National American Indian um, consortiums and we had different celebrations that we would do together but we but as different reservations reserved for our own cultures we were very disenfranchised from one another until that great meeting of people around that singular issue so we have been building over time some different networks that people can help out with, um, people can have solidarity with, um, people can move from being what is considered an ally to being a accomplice and then into being a co-conspirator <laughs> for saving the earth. Uh, those to me are kind of the three different paths forward First, allyship. First, build your understanding and acknowledgments and start building some relationships and connections. Then when you're moving into accomplice ships, then you're spreading the word and you're bringing more people into that conversation. And when you're co-conspirator, that's when you've actually forged those relationships and that's when you're actually doing things with people on behalf of people and sometimes putting yourself out there um, as a voice of knowledge. Um, so I, I put at least um, one, I can send some resources out. There's of course the Indigenous Environmental Network. There's a number of organizations like the Indigenous Agricultural Council who have been working together to um, build and reconnect all of our trade routes throughout Turtle Island, and even from my reservation all the way through Ohio and all the way out to the West Coast. Um, and those are being built right now as we speak. Um, those conferences are being held. Uh, the conversations are rich. Um, there's mentorships that are happening in food in farming and there's new legislation that is being drafted um, to, um, to help indigenous people get land back, to get individuals, um, get their hands back in the soil. Uh, that's what we need to do is as individuals, we need to grow food and we need to share. Thank you very much, Dawn. I, um, I know in the African American community, there's some um, concern that Blacks shouldn't feel like it's their job to educate whites about racism, that whites need to really do their own, own learning. And I know that there's some 
sensor have read of indigenous uh, people who get tired of being asked to present at conferences and then they just go home and nothing changes. So how I, I really appreciate this sort of trajectory that you talked about from being allies and learning, learning about traditions and then moving toward being co-conspirators. But for those of us who um, maybe are in areas where there's, there's not a visible indigenous presence, how do we can you suggest ways that we educate ourselves and sort of work toward decolonizing? Do you think we need to have indigenous people to be able to do that? Or is there work that we can be doing on our own in, in our own communities? Yeah, that's an excellent question, especially being here in Ohio where the indigenous people were brutally and forcibly removed in the late 1800s. And the stories are, I'm still trying to work my way through. They're, they're, they're just, um, heartbreaking, very heavy um, information that I can only take small doses at a time. Um, but yes, I absolutely agree with the critiques from um, the African-American communities and the black communities that talk about um, being having, having the labor of teaching people over and over again, that it can be exhausting. Um, it feels like, sometimes it feels like, haven't I told you that before? <laughs> so for me, I am personally committed to sharing knowledge. And there's a number of different indigenous people like me. Um, the organization where I'm a board member, the Greater Cincinnati Native American Coalition, is literally a coalition. It includes the Miami Valley Council on Native Americans. It includes the American Indian Movement of Ohio. Um, it includes um, Indian groups from Kentucky and um, the American Indian Center of Central Ohio. It's literally a coalition of people who are spreading the news about who is here, what it, what's indigeneity here in Ohio. And there are other coalitions just like that all around the country. It's difficult for these coalitions to um, kind of break the silence, I, I suppose and give people the resources that they need. Because as I said earlier, we're really, we're building, we're in building stages. Um, so support sometimes looks like funding. Support sometimes looks like educators and support sometimes looks like just an invitation um, to where you are, uh, whether that be in, uh, a, an organization or um, like at Community Solutions, like the, the, the barn space, holding listening sessions is uh, really important to do. Um, and finding your own resources and materials, that's a whole other difficult subject because so much that has been written about Native people has been written um, from a white person's perspective. I, I don't know how else to say it, but a Euro-American's perspective, those are the primary authors of our own stories. Um, there's a number of different books that are written by indigenous people uh, with the original instructions and stories. And I can put together some lists, but there's like the indigenous people's um, uh, now I can't even remember the book's name, but there's the Indigenous Peoples History of the United States. It's similar to some of the Zin books that were written, but it's actually written by Indigenous people um, with some of our origin stories. Thank you, John. And, and I'm assuming we can get these out to attendees of the conference. Yeah. Um, Andrea asked a really great question. Um, if you could help us understand the differences between indigenization and cultural appropriation. Yes, that is an excellent question. Cultural appropriation 
generally means that you are taking a stereotype of somebody and using that and um, almost like culture stealing in a way. Um, I see that play out in a number of different ways here in Ohio from the mascot issues to um, dressing up as Halloween, but also to um, some who have said, well, I am, you know, I'm part Indian, so now I speak on behalf of all of, of people. So it's generally taking kind of a group of people who don't have a voice on a matter and then speaking for them. Um, that has happened for a long time, for sure. Um, and, but there are ways that you can, you can, un, you can have the knowledge and not appropriate, uh, especially when you're in relationship with indigenous people. Um, that's number one. Not everybody has their, I mean, you don't need to tokenize. Not everybody has their Indian friends that can guide them. You know, you don't need a tanto. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is uh, taking the time to understand the real people. Uh, as human beings, we are all complicated. Um, indigenous knowledge does not lie with one person. And as I say over and over again, I do not speak on behalf of all Native people. Uh, that's number one. Number two, when we're thinking about the cultural appropriation within the realm of uh, regeneration, environmentalism, um, education, it is important to know your sources. And if something feels not quite right, if it feels too mythical, if it, if it seems too magical, then it probably is not authentic. The thing to understand about indigeneity is that um, tribes claim you, you don't claim tribes. So when I introduced myself, I said, I belong to the Anishinaabe people. That's because they claimed me. I'm a citizen of White Earth Nation. I'm literally a, have dual citizenship. There are 572 sovereign nations here in the United States. And I'm an enrolled member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe from the Otter Tail Pillager Band. That enrolled part means that I have an Indian card. I have federal recognition as a a tribal member and the federal government tracks my blood quantum and that's very messy stuff. But those pieces help to authenticate um, in some way what it means to be Native American. Unfortunately, there's these systems of authentication um, it, and it, it really is about my relationship with my tribal community that is most important to me beyond any kind of government ID card or tracking that the government does. I don't even care about that. What I care about is the knowledge that is passed down to me. And someday I hope to be an elder and pass uh, information on to others. Thank you and so I, much. Yeah, I work toward that. That was so powerful. And I, I regret to say that I fell down on the job. For some reason, I thought we had till 1015, but that's when Adam is supposed to start. So that was really incredible, Don. Thank you very much. Just to let folks know that Don is actually going to be the MC tomorrow morning. She'll be in a breakout with Rowan White tomorrow afternoon, um, and she will be in the water cooler right after this. So if you'd like to join her there, you can um, check on the link. Um, Dawn, I can't imagine a better start to our conference. Thank you. Thank you so very much. 
And what we'll do um, with an apology to Adam, why don't we start uh, instead of at 10.15, we'll start at 10.20 and we'll add five minutes on to the end so Adam gets his full time. Thanks all and get a little bit of a stretch and we'll see you back here at 10.20. Thank you. <laughs>